Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm amazed that so many people are coming. I guess this is uh, showing the benefit of putting the word dirty in the title. It's uh, obviously got some people interested, but yeah, you might be disappointed. Anyway, this is me. My name's James. Uh, I have been working for ThoughtWorks for the last three and a half years. Um, what I mainly do at ThoughtWorks is get involved in agile transformation type work. Um, this is the type of work that a lot of us ThoughtWorks consultants find quite boring. As a tech lead, actually, I've always enjoyed going out there and attempting to solve the organizational problems, which is essentially what I'm going to be talking about today. So, who is ThoughtWorks? Um, there's our marketing slides. Uh, if you're interested in ThoughtWorks, come and see me afterwards so I can tell you a bit more about our company. And here's a lot of the books that have been written by people from ThoughtWorks. Um, I've noticed one or two of these are on sale outside, actually. So go and help yourself, fill your boots. What am I here to talk about today? Well, uh, a little bit about Antwerp. I was really confused by this station. Now, uh, it, in terms of agility, it's amazing. Uh, it's the only sort of multi-decker station that I've ever got. It, I was so stunned by it, it took me ages to find my way out. And then when I got to the hotel, it turned out I was in room 101, which made me feel pretty nervous about things, I can tell you. Um, here's a little bit of Antwerp. I, I must say, it's, I've never been here before. Beautiful place. Um, Woody Zool told me when I saw him at a conference a few months ago that you should always put something about cats in. Unfortunately, all I could find in Antwerp was a golden dog, so no cats today, I'm afraid. And I found some great graffiti. There's a friend of mine at home that collects graffiti, so I'm going to show him that photo when I get home. Anyway, what am I here to talk about? So what I've discovered in my travels with ThoughtWorks is that what, what I see quite often is that people have, the word ag agile has become toxified in many places. Uh, we talk about it a lot, we try and make organizations agile, but some people don't believe in it. Uh, some people think they've tried it and so on. Um, so I'm gonna go through um, how did agile become a dirty word? What, 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 is, it, what is it like when it's dirty? Uh, and then how do we get to the solutions, and, and this is actually particularly in the last, uh, throughout this summer, I was working in an organization for which all of these things were true. They'd lost faith in a lot of what they were doing, they thought they were doing stuff, so this is a bit of a story of how we would affect those transformations in places that are possibly, shall we say, skeptical. So, how did Agile became a dirty word? So, if you've read the blurb on the talk, you probably know the answer. Does anybody know which country that is? Laos, good. And this one, Algeria. That is DRC, Congo. That's East Timor. That is Ethiopia. Uh, that's actually North Korea. It's the best map I could find. It had South Korea on it as well. And that is Sri Lanka. And finally, I think there's one more. That is Nepal. Anybody going to hazard a guess as to what all those countries have in common? Yes, indeed. Those are the countries of the world currently that has the word democratic in their name. <laughs> Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to whether these countries are democratic or not? Well, <laughs> shall we have a look at the democratic index? I think that tells you everything you need to know about bragging about being democratic. Um, so East Timor is apparently the most democratic. It's a flawed democracy. Just for reference, anybody want to guess what number one is, the most democratic country in the world? It's Norway. And the UK, for reference, comes in at, I was pleased to see, we're apparently a full democracy, comes in at number 14. And then just for reference, I looked up the USA, which is apparently a flawed democracy, but actually quite high. <laughs> um, if you're interested, I was going to put Belgium on here, but then when I looked at it, I thought that might be seen as sort of passive aggressive. So if you want to look up Belgium on that same list, <laughs> please, please do so. Now, why, why would I talk about this? So here's one of my clients. You might see him again a few times in this presentation. I went to this client in the summer, and the first thing the CTO said to me was, well, we've been doing Agile for two years. Well, a bit like the democracy thing. I think when people tell you they're doing Agile, they're not. 
It's a telltale sign. I mean, straight away, I'm tempted to say to this person, Agile's not something you do. Agile's something you are. It's a, it's a state of mind. It's a, it's a place. It's, it's, not a, it's not a set of things. You can't go and buy it. So, here's a list of some other words. I've come across words like this. These are all dirty words as well. Uh, I've worked in places where I wasn't expressly forbidden to mention the word Kanban, because apparently they tried it and it didn't work. I've been told more than once not to mention MVP. Why? Well, it's a dirty word, apparently. I, I, th I think people misunderstand it. I think they, uh, uh, in history, maybe they've been given an MVP and then the other features never arrive. I don't know. I, th I think that's probably a big thing. Um, but, you know, there's some other items there. And just another quick quiz now. Oh, no, it's coming later. I've forgotten the order of the slides. OK. How did we get to Agile as a dirty word? That's the question we're asking. This is a slide I presented in my last client. And you find this happens time and time and time again. Business puts pressure on tech teams to deliver stuff. And it can play out a bit like that. I've heard that phrase before. I don't need gold plating. Just give me the feature. So that leads to short-term decisions. People release stuff which maybe they don't write integration tests. Maybe they think the contract test can come later. Well, it, that never happens. So this is the dev thinking, well, you know, it works. So what do I know? I'm, I'm going to release it. I know it works in my head. So you, you build up tech debt. What then happens is cycle times go out. Everything takes longer and longer and longer and longer. There's the dev thinking, why is it taking me longer? Why is it taking me longer? It's because you made all those bad decisions before. And what does it lead to? Longer cycle times? Well, more pressure from the business. I've seen that cycle over and over and over again. And part of what we talk about to our clients is, how do you break out of this cycle? How do you get the business? How do you get your tech returning value to the business again? Here's another cycle. It's very similar. And um, someone does a bad release. This is talking about organizational scars within a business. We've all been there. You do a release, it blows up. Things go wrong. What's the response of that release? Well. Somebody says, we need more testing, we need more testing. Then what happens is somebody decides that it's a good idea to have a week's worth of manual testing on the new code. Believe me, this still goes on. What does more testing mean? Well, it means the cycle takes longer. That, that's fairly obvious. It's more, more and more longer to go and release. The last place I worked in, the, our first mission was to reduce their cycle time from four weeks. What does a longer cycle mean? Well, it means you release more stuff. And every time you release more stuff, and this was something I was putting across to this client, if you, have, if you release two things, it's not just two things that might cause a problem. It's two things that might cause a problem plus one interaction between two new things that might cause a problem. You can do the maths and see how quickly that multiplies up. And this company was doing a release with 35 items in it. I put the number in front of them and said, that's how many things can go wrong. Are you really sure this is a good idea? So bigger releases means you get more bad releases. And I, I, you might have guessed I was trying to scare somebody with that slide and that transition. So what does this all mean? This means that you can end up in an organization which has something that we call risk management theatre. Stacks and stacks and stacks of processes that are there, which maybe might have been a good idea when they were invented. You know, maybe 10 years ago, maybe it was a good idea to, to test things for a week, to chuck it over the wall to a test team and say, go ahead and test it. Doesn't make much sense now, perhaps. And you'll find that there's a lot of process in place that people have actually forgotten what the process is for. And sometimes these processes are not even owned by individuals. I actually once went around one of our clients and said, I don't think this process is adding value. Can you explain to me what outcome this is supporting? And I was told to speak to this person. She told me to speak to this person. She told me to speak to this person. I actually got referred to 12 different people before it went back to the first person and nobody knew who owned this process. So in the end, we said, OK, let's stop doing it. But it took ages. Uh, another organizational smell for risk management theater is massive meetings with loads of people in it. I was at a client this year, and they had these massive cycle times. And at the end of each cycle, they had a meeting which they called a go-no-go no go meeting. Now, I think when that was invented, the intent of that meeting 
was to decide whether to release or not to release. I went to this meeting um, 12 times. They never once said, don't release, which is interesting. So I don't think that meeting ever added any value. But what it did do was, there was between 16 and 32 people in the room at any given point, and these meetings lasted an hour. What I believe the actual purpose of that meeting was, was the people in the room knew that something was going to go wrong. But if they have a meeting and they get together and they agree between them that they're going to go with the release, no individual will get blamed. So the actual purpose of meetings such as that is to make sure that no one individual gets shouted at the most. That is what those meetings do. So you can see the signs with risk management theatre, and you can drill down and start to ask people, what is, what is the intent of this, of this thing? What outcome is this process driving us towards? Let's talk about those outcomes rather than the process itself. So that's a bit of the history. That's how you how the word agile can get toxified. What does dirty look like? Well, I think I touched upon it a little bit there. Well, firstly, one myth I want to debunk is that Scrum and Agile are not the same thing. Scrum may well be an attempt to implement Agile values, but you can't just do Scrum processes and call yourself Agile. And this is the biggest mistake we see everywhere. The reason why I got this slide up there is, I, as you can see, I googled for Scrum and Agile together, and there are how many? Uh, just 38 million references that have both the words Scrum and Agile in. So I think a lot of people see them as the same thing. Has anybody heard the phrase cargo cult before? Yeah, a few people. So um, the story goes that certain places in the Pacific during the Second World War, when the Americans were fighting the war, they would go from island to island and they built airstrips. Now, what then happened with those airstrips is that airplanes landed on them and they disgorged cargo. Now, the people on those islands who perhaps weren't uh, in the most advanced of societies, they, they gained prosperity through that. They, they gained the supplies from, from these um, aeroplanes. Then after the war, of course, the, the Americans never went back. So the people, apparently, there are some places in the world where they built the airstrips believing that that would attract the aeroplanes. Now, this is a, a classic it is a cargo cult. And what we mean by this in Agile, and we see this time and time again, is people, and this goes back to the gentleman that I was talking about earlier, who said, we're doing Agile. What actually are they doing? They're following a set of rituals which somebody, probably somebody that's Scrum certified, certified, easy for me to say, has told them is Agile. Well, that's questionable. So all over um, the IT industry, ThoughtWorks does a lot of research. We do a lot of... Um, articles, writing, and so on. This is a new ThoughtWorks publication called Perspectives. Um, the first edition actually came out just a couple of weeks ago, and um, uh, some of us contributed to, to this. And part of it was talking about the rise of fake agile. And I think what we see time and time again is that big corporations go out, or well, it doesn't necessarily need to be a big corporation. They think that agile is something they can go and buy. You know, Come and give me sell Agile to me. And the way that that often happens is just exactly through these rituals. Somebody comes along and says, if you do this ritual, then this ritual, then this ritual, hey, presto, you're Agile. And I've seen that in play. That's exactly the state that my last client was in. And there are various frameworks and so on um, that purport to, to be Agile. I just want to talk about SAFE briefly. Has anybody in this room ever come across SAFE? So I think it stands for the Scaled Agile Framework. I just wanted to talk about it briefly because there's nine principles there, which actually I think are OK. If you go through those in turn, actually, there is one I want to get rid of, which is that one. Because that one, I think, is underpins everything that's wrong with SAFE, because that one admits it, it, it says deal with coupling, don't decouple. I find the fact that you can certify your business as a scaled agile partner baffling, absolutely baffling. I, it's like. Um, Project managers in the 1990s, the 2000s, they go out and they get Scrum Master training, then someone says, oh, we're Agile now. <laughs> really? So let's talk about this diagram. This, this diagram is, is apparently the, the SAFE diagram. <laughs> what an ironic name for the framework. I want to drill into that, because I think that diagram scares me. Let's see how that looks on the big slide. Oh, beautiful. I can read it better up there now. 
So what does this all mean? Actually, I think there's some quite cool stuff at the top of this. Um, I like the idea that there are strategic themes, portfolio management, lean budgets. I think that's a good idea, which I assume means that uh, you, know, you assign small budgets to get small wins. Um, I don't like um, that person, epic owners. And I certainly don't like enterprise architects. I've done a talk about them before. And, yeah. Well, I, I don't dislike the individuals, but I dislike the function. Uh, and uh, why there is a backlog at the portfolio level, I've got no idea. Now, then the next one is just called coordination of a large solution. I, I hate everything about that slice. <laughs> why, why on earth do you think being agile means coordination to, to make yourself like this? So that, you know, I can't move until that person moves. How is that agile? So I don't think there's anything to like in that slice. Oh, no, there's an economic framework. For some reason, I gave that a tick. Next level down, program level. OK, well, again, I don't quite understand what that section is. Why is there yet another backlog? Oof, like a backlog hierarchy. That, that just blows my mind. Um, Cross, cross, cross. Oh, now, this is my absolute least favorite part coming up here. Those yellow lines represent uh, program increments, PI planning. I worked for a company last year. They had this PI planning meeting. It had 48 attendees in London, and it had 50 attendees in New York. It started at 5 p.m. London time, went until 10 p.m. So five hours, you can do the maths, about 500 person hours involved there. Five days it took. Five days for 100 people for five hours of time. And what did it achieve? Not much. My take to that was we went to them and said, OK, the meeting cost this much. Why don't you invest the money on decoupling all your systems and your teams instead? Then maybe you actually will get agility. Um, I'm not sure why I've got a cross on that one. I must have been going a bit mad. Um, not quite sure why Kanban's there. Um, I like that. That's an agile team. I'd call that a cross-functional team. That's a good bit. But then this bottom slice, apart from the PI stuff, is probably OK. And then built-in quality, I love. I don't quite know why it's there. And DevOps up there, just that baffles me. DevOps is not a team, it's a culture. And why is it at the second level? Why isn't it down with those cross-functional teams on the right there? So what do we think about agile, scaled agile, ugh, safe? Um, actually, I think that of it. I think it's a desire for people in the business to still think they've got command and control, but they, they really want to be, they want to sell the world they're agile. You know, they want to tell their devs they're agile. We can draw our own conclusions about safe. I think you've probably guessed what my opinion is. Here's my client again. He's saying to me, and this is representing a he, by the way. Um, he did say exactly that to me. Yeah, we tried Kanban, it doesn't work. Well, I know it works some places, but it won't work for us. Yeah, we're a special case. Really? Come on. I mean, we see this all over the place. So here's, here's some effects of, of Agile. I think um, these are the things that we think we ought to get out of Agile. And I think some of the key points, that, well, they're all good points. Empowering the individuals is a great point. We come back to that. Small, safe-to-fail bets is, is massive. And then if you do Agile badly, what we can actually see happening, and this is what I've seen time and time again, is, is stuff that's more akin to this. And I think you've probably all been involved in stuff like that from time to time. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't want to see me ranting about it. I Actually, that top line, I love that. Burning money iteratively. When I was at an Agile conference uh, a few weeks ago, uh, one of the other speakers gave that line to me, and I was like, I'm going to use that, sorry. <laughs> one of the best lines I've ever heard. OK. So we're still talking about what bad looks like, aren't we? OK. So uh, here's our client again. This, I think, is one of the biggest ills of software delivery now is the, the annual budget. I've got a couple of stories that I can tell about annual budgets. Here's some numbers of annual budgets. No idea why I've got a cheese shop representing that. I must have been a bit desperate on pictures. Um, I was working for a client last year, 
they had, someone had taken a decision two or three years ago to invest in a data center. So it was their own data center. Uh, don't know if it was a good decision at the time. Don't know if this person had political or personal capital invested in it. Um, but by the time we were there, uh, I forget the numbers, so I could be orders of magnitude out, but we did a calculation. Maintaining the data center as it currently was was costing them in the region of £150,000 a month. That, that was the ongoing cost of maintaining it, not the capital cost that they've already expended. And we did the, the numbers, and to move it all to AWS, um, the, the ongoing maintenance cost on AWS would have been about a third of what they were paying. So we suggested, well, why don't you move to AWS? That feels like a, a sensible decision. But you haven't thought about the funding gods. So they said yes, in terms of enterprise agility, yes, in terms of sensible planning, yes, that all makes sense. But if we stop using this data center, we will have to write down the cost which was supposed to have been written down over the next seven years into next year's accounts. It will show as a loss. So that's unacceptable because that will affect our budget for the following year. I, it, it was just amazing to me. And one more anecdote, when I was working for a bank, we had funding to, to do a product. We had funding until the end of that year. It was eight months of funding to deliver this product. We needed a decisioning system, which was third-party software. There was a um, off-prem hosted version, and that would have cost us over the next three years. We had to sign up to a three-year contract, and it was going to cost us something like uh, a quarter of a million pounds a year if we had the version hosted by the vendor. Or we could pay for it ourselves. We could actually buy it and host it on our own servers. Now, the second version, the one that we hosted ourselves, cost something, it was the, the three-year cost, well, the, it was something like five million pounds. So instead of costing us two and a half million over three years, we had to spend five million pounds now. And again, forgive me, the numbers, are, I can't remember, that, but it was, it was about twice as much. We could not do the three-year solution because the bank only had funding until the end of this year. What we didn't spend this year disappeared somewhere. Don't ask me where. So we, we were not allowed to save the bank two and a half million pounds because of this type of thinking. I, I mean, the mind boggles. I'm just, every time I'm astonished by that type of stuff. So it, it makes it really hard to, to understand how to fund your products. It makes it really hard to, to go to these people and say, well, I need a DevOps culture. I need to invest in, in monitoring. I need to invest in all the things that give me enterprise agility. And they're like, well, no, because you can just spend the money now. <laughs> yeah, if I could change one thing about the way business works, it would be funding cycles. Yeah. If you've got bad agile, if well, bad anything, you have a blame culture. Uh, I sincerely hope people in this room don't work in a blame culture, and I think the world is getting better at getting away from blame cultures. Um, I don't think I really understood what blame culture meant until I started at ThoughtWorks. Before that, I realized actually that I actually thought we were working in something akin to a hero culture, and then I actually realized after, long afterwards, well, actually, a blame culture is the same thing. If you work in an environment where it's important that you take credit for stuff that goes well, then it's equally important to make sure you don't get blamed when they go wrong. And, you know, why is a blame culture bad? Well, people are scared to make bold decisions. And this works directly against agility. If, if I want to go out and try something new, but I know that there will be consequences if it doesn't work, whatever work means, that is going to discourage me from innovation. And I think blame cultures are a big part of what we call the, the um, uh, corporate immune system. If you're scared of things going wrong, you don't innovate. Anything new that comes in, the higher it goes up the food chain in terms of the hierarchy, and you probably will have a hierarchy if this, if this is where you live and work, uh, it's more likely to get turned down. So blame culture is something that we need to move past. Oh, and one final thing on blame. So in, I think, the Agile Manifesto has been around since 2001. I worked on waterfall projects in the 1990s. Uh, so I've done those big deliveries, those big unwieldy deliveries that fail. We blamed the methodology. We said there must be a better way. That's why we came up with XP, we came up with Agile, we came up with various ways. Things move on. Now, I think what happens, and this is a big reason for things being toxified, you need something to pin the blame on something. And I think in big organizations, they, they pin the blame on Agile. 
It's a bit like how everybody hates Jira. Does everybody hate Jira? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I don't. I think Jira gets unfairly blamed because people use it in a certain way to try and modify a behavior. Frankly, it doesn't matter whether you use Jira, Mingle, whatever tool you use for that, everybody hates it. That's the thing that gets the blame, so I think Agile is always in the firing line and getting blamed, hence these attitudes. So, stage one, how do we move away from Agile being a dirty word? And this, this is a real case study. I've mashed up some of the stuff that we've done at ThoughtWorks over the last year, year and a half with various clients. Stage one is to avoid those dirty words. How do I do that? So, let's just go over quickly what Agile means. I mentioned this earlier, it doesn't mean Scrum, it doesn't mean Kanban, it really doesn't mean any kind of prescriptive process. There is nothing in the Agile manifesto that says how to do things, it just says what we should do. And as I said earlier, you definitely just can't go and buy it. So what is Agile? It is four value statements and 12 principles. Now, there's a, a website called agilemanifesto.org where this is all printed. I would urge anybody to just go and look at this if you haven't done recently, probably print out these four values, laminate them and stick them up on your team wall. Because they're, they're so important. And you'll see there, there's nothing about how to do things. It just says we value this more than we value this. Uh, it goes on to say uh, we still value the stuff on the right, we just value the stuff on the left more. And I always think when I see this picture, that's probably Martin Fowler, because it looks a bit like him. Recognise his bald head. And he was at the meeting. There are 12 Agile principles. I'm not going to go through them all because we'll be here all day. Um, I've picked out some of them. Um, the first one, early and continuous delivery of valuable software. This is the thing we should all be going for. Let's just get software done. Get it ready, get it working, get it in front of end users. Uh, the second bullet actually needs updating because they wrote this manifesto, I think, in 2001. So uh, it talks about delivering software frequently. Uh, up to a couple of weeks or months, yeah. I, th I think that one should probably be updated. The rest don't need any updating. And then I love the fact that it talks about motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. The absence of trust is a massive problem in a lot of command and control environments, a lot of blame cultures. Trust us to get it done. Empower us with the outcomes, and then we can go there. So that's what Agile's really about. So what we found was really successful for us was talking about the values of Agile without ever mentioning the word Agile. This is what I mean about avoiding the dirty word, avoid the smell. So this presentation here I gave to two clients, uh, once, once this year and once last year, and the idea was to convey the notion of what Agile really means, what are the values that we should all be sticking to, but without ever actually mentioning the word Agile. The title originally came about for a slightly different motivation. A colleague of mine said, what have you found there? And I said, well, they're not doing Agile. They, they don't understand what it means. They don't. And she said to me, well, why don't you do Agile 101 as a presentation? And I said, well, I don't think I can really do that. They think they're being Agile. So if I go in and start off and introduce myself to this new client and say, hey, that stuff you think you're doing, well, you're not, didn't work. So she suggested uh, a presentation called Kanban, Flow Control and the Theory of Constraints which I thought was brilliant. Um, it then later morphed into this, TPS value streams and the theory of constraints. And those are the messages that I was trying to put across. So again, you'll see there's nothing there about the word agile. So whatever the messaging is you want to put across, you can tailor it nicely, but I guarantee you out of those 12 values, those, those four value statements and the 12 core principles, you should find stuff to talk about. So you can get everybody thinking the agile way without mentioning the word agile. This has worked for us in, in two or three big places. And here's another example of a dirty word. Uh, where the client we were working for thinks they're, well, they are a luxury business. This was last year or this year. And they have this obsession that the product has to be finished. And our point was, well, OK, well, let's not talk about MVP. There's something understanding it. So this is my visual metaphor for it. This is a, a very good friend of mine, a colleague from ThoughtWorks. We wanted to make a picture that did that thing that you see in films where there's a green glow coming off the screen which illustrates that that person must be a hacker, right? You see it in 24, you see it in anything that is pseudo-technology type stuff. So here's the picture, we put it in the newsletter and I think you'll agree it, it kind of works. Um, what I'm going to do now is zoom out on the actual original photo so you can see my low-tech MVP. 
Now, the end user doesn't need to know what's going on in the background there. So this is our illustration of this is what an MVP means. And successfully in the past, we've got people to understand. I've, I've been involved in projects where we write the front end, we write everything, we get all the end user functionality done perfectly, and we don't even bother with the back end because we're just going to wait and see all the back end was is just bringing the messages in. That's what an MVP means to me. Or that's one example. <sighs> value stream mapping is another way of talking to your client about agile values. Um, I don't think waste is a dirty word. Kanban tries to uh, address waste. I think the Japanese word is muda, if I remember rightly. So we did this simple illustration of a value stream map. Everything that's in green adds value. Everything that's in red doesn't. Everything else is waste. And there you've got all the context switches or handovers from one team to another. This is just an exemplar. So I said to the client, well, here's some example. OK, there's time advancing. There's some things that are waste. And there's some things that add value. And there's a lot of handovers. And I'm really disappointed that that label is wrapped in the next line that should say analysis. Um, the client thought that I was being a bit argumentative by mentioning that code review was waste, but I still think code review is a waste. Uh, and the key point is, only at the end of that stream there do you return value to the business. It's incredible how many execs, how many high-level managers don't get that. OK, you can squash that cycle down by bringing all your QA forward. There's many, many ways we can do it. So um, what I think you find happens often when we start talking about waste, uh, we start getting people to think about it, and we start getting people to focus on valuable outcomes rather than um, a process, waste starts to go away. Uh, here's a little quiz again. Can anybody see the waste in this photo? This was when I was at a conference in the summer, and this is the aftermath of England losing in the semi-final of the World Cup, which obviously upset me massively. Um, I was sitting in the front row there, and then I helped to clear up the room afterwards. Uh, and I asked a few people at my client, where's the waste? And of course, people sort of point to the bin, people point to this. Actually, that's the waste there. That's where I spilt my beer. <laughs> that, that stuff there returns no value. The value I was looking for was to absolutely get, get my mind off the fact that we just lost to Croatia. So it can be interesting to talk about waste. It's not a dirty word, and it, and it leads into good outcomes. Oh, yeah. Here's my client again. He says a lot of stuff, this guy, doesn't he? Give me some examples of Agile. I've had this said to me. Give me some examples. Where does it work? Where have you seen it work? That's kind of hard to do. And, and another way that I like to talk about this, again, is to avoid it. I look in the press. Here's a story I found recently, um, October the 14th, so just a month ago today. There was an article in the Times, the UK newspaper, about Jose Mourinho, the football manager, and how maybe his powers are waning. Where's the next great manager coming from? There are a couple of candidates. Uh, I know you won't be able to read that text, so I'm going to zoom in on this third paragraph here. Uh, it's about that gentleman on the right, whose name I can't remember, uh, Tedesco. Here's the important part, the bit highlighted in yellow. So apparently Tedesco's got a revolutionary way of inviting the players to help determine tactics and preparation for games. Who knew? How much he stimulated them to review their own performances, so to get them to learn from stuff. He, he's got a learning culture going. Apparently, he's got a God-given talent for motivating and explaining. Well, that's a big statement. I think he's just applying agile principles myself. Um, and Tedesco says, a team believes more strongly in a plan if they feel they had a hand conceiving it. That's a great point. So you can find things in the press that will talk about agile values, but without mentioning the word agile. I've, I've got, I'm pretty sure the journalist that wrote this article has never heard of agile with a big A. Well, that's just a guess. Maybe he has. So you can avoid mentioning it. So that's your stage one. Then stage two, once you've managed to get people to focus on, on agile principles, agile values, how do we then clean up this mess? How do we then get it back to a stage where uh, we can start using the word agile again? So some more practical things. And again, we're going to start with my client. Um, he says they've got a strategy. And it's set in stone. I don't quite understand what's agile about that. Because, you know, my response to that is that. It's not, 
It's not my quote. Uh, I, I, it's attributed to Mike Tyson, the boxer. <laughs> and, you know, I think it's so apposite. It's, you know, you're executing on your strategy. You know what, go, go back through recent business history and show me where a company was successful through rigidly sticking to a sp particular strategy. So uh, I guess this comes into the, sort of crosses the borders of the last section, but by not mentioning the A word, um, but also coming up with a different A word, an analogy, a, a thing, uh, I'm going to tell another quick story. So this is Leicester Forest Services on the M1 in the UK. <laughs> Good, great place to start this. It always gets people's attention. I happen to know, um, because I've driven south on the M1 from lots of stag do's, that um, uh, on that bridge thing there, above the motorway, there is, uh, there's places to go and eat. I was driving back home from Darlington. I was very hungry, and I was, what was I looking forward to? I was really looking forward to a KFC. I don't know if you get that in this country, but anyway. One thing that's always annoyed me about this particular restaurant there is there's a Burger King right next door to a KFC on, in that building that I just showed you. The Burger King has this advert constantly for its chicken products. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but if I'm going to buy a chicken product, I ain't going to buy it from a Burger King when there is a KFC literally in the booth next to it. So I've always seen that and just gone, it annoys the hell out of me. It's like, concentrate on your beef burger products, please, right? Because that might be why I want to buy something from you. Not going to be the chicken. So, on this occasion, I'm there. We'll come back to this notice in a moment. So, I'm, I was really desperate for KFC. I go up to the top floor to have a look at this place, and what happens? Well, that happens. The KFC was closed for refurbishment. So, I was devastated. So, I'm like, oh, God, well, I'll, I'll have to get a, a double whopper with cheese or whatever. And then, what happens? Sorry, I think I just zapped someone with my laser pen. I see this notice, so I'm going to zoom in on that notice so you can see what it says. Well, it's still a bit blurred. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a close-up, but I'll tell you what it says. <sighs> we can't serve any beef products at the moment. You can have chicken. <laughs> Sorry. So, what do I do? Well, I don't, fan I don't like the vegetarian products from Burger King, so I got one of those chicken burgers. And lo and behold, it was amazing. It was the most amazing chicken product I've ever had, and I thought, my God, I've been missing this all my life. So I changed strategy from that point onward. I pivoted. I said, right, I'm going to use Burger King for chicken products from now on. And I was forced to do that by the circumstances. Now, this is called an emergent strategy. And this is something that all businesses need to be aware of. To be truly agile, you need to talk about, I have agility, I'm prepared to pivot, I'm prepared to move on. Um, if you read about Honda, in the 1980s, I think it was, Honda tried to get into the US market. They started selling motorbikes, big motorbikes that they thought were tailored for the US market. And it turned out they all were breaking because of dust in the engines and so on. They, they weren't really right for the American market. It nearly ruined the company. And what then happened was the execs, the Honda execs, they were living in uh, California somewhere. Uh, they had these tiny little motorbikes that were called Honda Cubs. They were using them for their own personal use. And the story goes that one day that the Honda was almost ruined. They took the bikes out of the city, I think it was San Fran or, or LA, I'm not sure which, and they rode the bikes up and down the sand dunes just to blow off some steam. This activity was seen by local youths who asked them, wow, where can I buy one of those bikes? And they were like, well, we don't sell these, we sell these other bikes. And then they realized, oh, they want them. So they then started importing these smaller bikes, these Honda Cubs to the US. None of the dealers would sell them for them, because why would I sell a bike for $500 when I can sell one for $5,000? Well, I want the commission on the $5,000, not the $500. So the dealer network in the US would not sell these bikes for them. So then they actually sold them into sporting goods outlets. They invented what the Americans now call dirt biking, totally by accident. And it completely saved Honda as a company. So. How do you get there? So what we always say to people, I by the thoroughly recommend this book, The Goal. If you haven't read it, please do. The first thing we've always done with our teams, or one of the first things when we go into a new client, we talk about what's the goal of your team. You will be amazed at how often they don't know. They don't know what their purpose is. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing. They, they've never sat down and agreed, this is what we do. It's a, it's a hugely valuable exercise to sit down and say, OK, Let's talk about, let's make a simple statement about what it is we do, and then let's talk about some values that we apply to this. 
And usually it's really valuable if you can come up with the form of uh, we value this over this. For example, a team I worked in, uh, which I'll come back to in a moment, we said we value understanding integrations over um, slick UI. And that helped us to make prioritization decisions. You will find that the agile values will always lead to a better application of that overarching goal that you set yourself. And then finally, and this is the message of that book, the goal, always understand what the biggest constraint on your group is and fix that. There is no point in other local optimizations. That's explained more fully in the goal. So we, got people, we get people to concentrate on just one thing at a time. Fix this, then move on, then fix this, then move on, and so on. And hugely importantly, uh, nobody cares about the process. Honestly, in the last company I worked at, we said, uh, OK, you're doing all these agile rituals. Why are you doing them? And the Scrum Master said, well, because that's what we do. I said, OK, have you explained to the people in the room why you're doing that? And he was like, well, it, it's in all the documentation. And I said, that's not what I said. Do you think people read your presentations? I don't think so. So I asked him, at the start of every meeting, please sit down and explain what the outcome is you're working towards. You will find that that really helps. And then talk to all the team members one by one and explain what it means to them. Your devs do not really value the outcome of having enough stories ready for dev at the start of the sprint. What they will value is being told, if you don't do this, this pain will happen to you, and this pain will happen to you. We will relieve that pain by respecting this meeting, by respecting the outcome here. And then you'll find people will want to do those rituals. You need to get buy-in from everybody. We start talking about Agile, the Agile values, collaboration, co-ownership of outcomes. Everybody needs to get bought in. Everybody needs to share the pains and successes. Big tip I've given to other tech leads that are learning is uh, you don't make decisions. You guide the team in making a decision. This goes back to that football manager we spoke about a little while ago. By getting everybody to take part in the decision, by getting everybody to take part in continual improvement, everybody buys in. Everybody wants it. You can design workshops quite easily. I've blogged about a few. Uh, that's not my blog, but uh, about how we did this. Here's a straightforward example. Um, we had a company that was disappearing under tech debt. I love this picture. Again, it's not my picture. Um, to me, that illustrates the absurdity of people not wanting to fix their tech debt. Uh, it's a great illustration. I wish I'd drawn that picture, but yeah, I didn't. Uh, how did we do that? We ran a workshop. We sat down with product people, with devs, and uh, this picture is cause and effect of uh, tech debt items. I can't remember which is which. But the interesting thing was, we then started drawing arrows on it to say, this thing here leads to this thing leads to this thing. And then all of a sudden, everybody realized, oh god, I'm causing myself pain. The product people started going, wow. By asking them not to do that test, I've stopped myself from gap and so on. So they could see this cycle being in place. It was so successful. And then we, we managed to get a plan. This is a picture of a uh, pair programming workshop. This company were in that same situation. They felt they wanted to improve, but they didn't feel they had the time. So we ran this workshop whereby we said to them, OK, we're going to do this every, we did it twice a week in the end. It was hugely successful. We, it's not going to be a classroom learning. You come to us and bring the story that you're working on with you. So in that way, we taught them how to pair, but they didn't put down their actual work. So the, it, it went down much better with the managers. The managers could finally break out of that cycle with the cavemen. So what does clean look like? If we manage to get to a stage where agile isn't a dirty word anymore, what would that look like? Well, hopefully we start breaking down all the silos. It would be great if, instead of having enterprise architects, we could have architects that are focusing on customer outcomes. And I've seen that happen in companies, and it's massive. It's brilliant. The architects love it. All of a sudden, they're actually producing a product rather than drawing diagrams. And believe me, they draw a lot of diagrams. And you will find that you will want to decouple all your technology so that all your teams can actually deliver value quickly. Once everybody is focusing on delivering that value quickly, it makes sense all of a sudden to invest the time up front to decouple some technology. Get away from that PI planning stuff. A quick case study. Um, last year, we worked for a company who is a publisher. 
Uh, they get a load of documents in one side of their system, then they, these documents have a load of XML added that drives functionality in an end user app. They had about 15 different technology silos, which we had to traverse to add any value. And then they had this thing called the enhanced document, which went into a document database, which was then consumed. So they called that content production. The document database was consumed by something called shared display services, which was in turn consumed by a US app, which was live, and a UK app, which wasn't yet, which was what we were asked to help with. The, these apps were so tightly coupled at this level that in order to release the UK app to the pre-production environment, we had to release the US app to production, which, wow, you can imagine how scary that was to us. So they, at the time that we started working with them, um, it was taking 13 months to, to achieve this whole value stream. And the point of us being there was we need to get the value delivered quicker. We need to follow the agile principles. So essentially, we got them focusing on the customer outcomes. We got them talking about agile. We got them understanding what agile means. And essentially, we said, OK, we stopped asking what this siloed system does. And we started asking, how do I deliver this piece of customer value? Because the conversation started with them saying, well, you've got to put the content through all these 15 things. And wow. So when we actually said, well, actually, what does it do? Why does it do it? it? Turned out that we could just bypass those siloed processes. And they were actually all doing really simple things. It's just not anybody understood the whole joined up picture. We repurposed an architect to work with us on this, just this outcome. And we managed to bypass all those systems just by writing some new, oh, look at that. The label's gone wrong again bypassed all these 15 silos so that we could get the stuff into the document database. We decoupled our app into what we were calling a microservice. I don't think it was a microservice, but the client thought it was a nice word. We, um, we bypassed this shared stuff here. So we were in a position now where we could deploy our piece of the app uh, independently. The UK app essentially reverse proxied onto our app. And we reduced the cycle time from 13 months to like a day was a great outcome. And it was all because we were following the agile values and we were, we were concentrating on the outcomes rather than how we get there. I think I've said a bit about clearly articulating goals. If everybody knows their goals and values, I, as I say, I'd recommend laminating them, sticking them up on the wall. Uh, that thing that I just described, that was where we valued understanding the integrations over the UI, essentially. When you have teams that are aligned on the same goal, they will work better together. I'm sure we've all been in a position where the infrastructure team is absolutely obstructive to the goals of the software development team, because the infrastructure team is incentivized for stability, but we want to return value quickly. If you can get everybody working together and aligned, that situation goes away. Then you can get to the place where your learning culture supersedes the blame culture. So people are now willing to learn. This is the sort of end state that's great to get to. If everybody's willing to learn, if you talk about experiments rather than failures, if you talk about learning rather than failure, you're in a great place. And you will hopefully be having blame-free retros. This is the Retro Prime Directive. Um, again, this is another thing that I would advise printing out. We read this before every retro. And it's surprisingly powerful. People fear what they may say in a retro. But if you read this out to make it very clear to everybody that we're not doing this for blame, we're doing this for learning, then you'll be in a much better place. So here's my exec summary. That's Woody Zool, by the way. I know I'm name dropping, but hey. Um, Agile's not a process. It is about facilitating useful outcomes. It's about culture and values, people. And it is not a dirty word when you understand what it means. So if you're in an organization where Agile is in a dirty word, understand the history. Why is it dirty? Avoid it to start with, then start cleaning it up. And then when your teams are trusted and empowered to deliver value quickly whilst they're owning and improving their own destiny, Agile is no longer a dirty word. So you should be in a happy place. There's some books. I highly recommend this one up here, Enterprise Agility. It was just published a couple of weeks ago by one of my colleagues. I'm, I don't get a commission there, um, although I did get interviewed for part of the book. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>